so yeah, here we are with another episode uh, with uh, San- Santi Siri, who is a human at Proof of Humanity and a hacktivist at Democracy Earth and a teacher at the Education DAO. And we're here to kind of explore the implications of you know building identity protocols on top of um, you know NFT based. Uh, systems and infrastructure and you know just trying to go into the depth with these so i i think the best way to kind of start is you know um you know santi if you kind of give us a a background um into what you're doing how you got there in a you know a sort of linear kind of way i think that's probably the best place to jump off all right sounds good um so i i'm from argentina i i grew up there and uh, probably over the last decade, I've been very much into researching what is the intersection of uh, technology and politics. Uh, Ten years ago, I started a political party in Buenos Aires called Partido de la Red, or the Internet Party. It had candidates that would commit to vote everything in Congress according to how people tell them online how to vote. So that led to researching you know, what's, what, what would it take to see a democracy uh happen over the internet what's the right technology what's the right approach to that and uh, this was back when bitcoin was uh, barely beginning uh, in argentina being in a country with very high inflation bitcoin is naturally a very interesting technology and even though the party ran for its first election in 2013 we got 1% of the votes it wasn't enough to to get the candidate in congress the software we were starting to build uh, started to get adoption by different political movements and organizations around the world. So that led to, in 2015, uh, Y Combinator saw what we did in, in Buenos Aires, and they gave us a grant uh, that allowed us to move to California and start uh, the Democracy Earth Foundation, which is a nonprofit organization that researches democracy in the information age and uh, we do it by building open source technology that runs on censorship resistant networks uh, and uh, that you know can be implemented with with free software and um, over the last uh, seven years we have been researching uh, and implementing democratic pilots around the world uh, and uh, long story short uh, it is very clear to us that the main challenge for a democracy on the internet is to figure out how to do identity the right way. Identity is the one vulnerability being exploited across all systems. Um, and, uh, you know, in the age of uh, democracies being broken by the role of Facebook and surveillance uh, capitalism, where uh, these large repositories of uh, centralized identity indexes uh, suddenly have a tremendous influence. So what would it take to decentralize identity and what would it take to make a system that you can start a protocol where you can start building on top democracies or different kinds of social systems used leveraging the, the power of blockchain networks. Uh, so this year we launched Proof of Humanity, which is a, a decentralized protocol for human identity that verifies whether or not an address on Ethereum belongs to a human, and it does so through a series of incentives where people end up checking on each other. And uh, on top of that, we built a universal basic income token and that gets streamed immediately once you become verified on proof of humanity. So uh, it's a very interesting project. We are reaching almost 10,000 humans now. It's been live for the last six months. Uh, we've been running a DAO uh, com- in a completely democratic way, and uh, I have to say that we are, you know, very, very optimistic about the, you know, where where this project can take us into the future. Yeah, um, I, I I think one one key issue is, um, you know, just going right into it is, you mentioned cyber attacks. Um, you know, do you do you want to kind of explain how these are, are are a problem in you know crypto per se, and then how, how you kind of kind of um, you know address them? So a civil attack 
is basically an identity pretending to be multiple identities. Uh, it uh, has been the original paper from 2001, is from a Microsoft research paper, uh, uses the name Sybil after the movie Sybil from the 70s, where it's about a woman with schizophrenia that has multiple personalities. And it's a very common attack uh, in, in digital networks. We actually, with the, the pilots that we have been doing around the world, even though we were not uh, using decentralized networks at the beginning, we're just using like traditional databases and, uh, and uh, simply focusing on developing open source technology. Uh, more often than not, when we did democratic pilots in contexts where you have organizations that need to make a relevant decision, uh, a couple of times we or our, our pilots got attacked by an entity that generated multiple identities in, uh, and pretended to be multiple identities when we really were able to check that those identities were coming from the same source or the same IP address. Um, so uh, in centralized systems, you know, whoever controls a database uh, can decide whether or not uh, yeah. Uh, who to register uh, or, or to if, it, if it's going to, you know, where is the admin can delay certain people from registering or accelerating certain other people from registering. But then again, <clears throat> being able to check that effectively one person controls one uh, identity uh, is a major task. In Proof of Humanity, we uh, have a whole process where when you create an identity, you have to get a vouch from someone that has been verified before. Um, vouches, for example, get processed in a sequential way. So if you get multiple vouches, um, those vouches will get processed one after each other uh, through a period of three and a half days each vouch. Uh, this is a way for the system for for the system to prevent the attack from a network of spam bots, for example, that suddenly start vouching for each other. Uh, and if they were able to do it in a parallel uh, way, they would be able to successfully hijack the registry of identities. Um, so we have multiple uh, techniques in, in baked in into the protocol that uh, made it at least very costly or very expensive to generate multiple identities at once. Um, and at the same time, we we try to keep a, a, a tool that is, you know, anyone can access it on proofofhumanity.id. That's, you know, you you are incentivized uh, if you want to challenge and you are, if you are able to identify a fake uh, identity or a, a duplicate identity as a challenger, you, you have the benefit of earning a the, the deposit cost of generating an identity. And, uh, you know, that's, that's another approach where through the use of incentives, uh, we try to prevent as much as possible from duplicates. We have found uh, a puppeteer attack, uh, someone that apparently was picking up people on the streets and asking them to do the video for proof of humanity. Uh, but that got detected and that got challenged and, and you know, those profiles ended up being kicked out from the system. Uh, so it's interesting to see how people will try to game it, but so far, uh, at least at, at this rate of 10,000 profiles, uh, we only had around 500 challenges and uh, we, we, we still haven't found any uh, convincing evidence of duplicate addresses or duplicate identities. That just, uh, I just wanted to touch on the puppeteer attack because, um, you know, that's the first time I've ever heard of such a thing. <laughs> I mean, like, so how, how did you guys detect that? So it was really funny uh, when each profile on Proof of Humanity requires to have a video. Uh, it's, you know, the one trade-off that uh, it's required so people can over time check if the person appearing in the video is who he or she says he is or uh, to check against other registries whether or not it's a duplicate. Um, and uh, one day someone a set of profiles emerged that they all looked from uh, people in the streets. Uh, they were actually on the same street, uh, the same background, like the same neighborhood. And uh, someone on Telegram said, hey, what's going on with this guy? Uh, 
and uh, you can look at the vouchers, you know, who has vouched for who, and apparently, yeah, someone was uh, picking up people on the streets, uh, asking them to show uh, an Ethereum address and say the, the statement that you have to say on the video. And, uh, you know, when you track the vouchers, they all look coming from the same source. So you can challenge that as a series of duplicate profiles and duplicate profiles uh, if they are successfully challenged, they get kicked out from the registry and every single one that person has vouched for. So it was interesting. Uh, we were able to detect the attack because ultimately all of the videos were happening in the same streets and someone noticed that there was something weird about that. Besides the um, the ownership of the of the UBI token and being part of the the network there, um, what what incentives do you have to um, to keep people engaged in sort of rooting out these these sorts of attacks going forward as things scale? So right now the the incentives you know when you create a profile you have to pay a deposit. Uh, right now it's at 0 0.12 ETH. Uh, we're looking always into ways of making this more accessible. If you don't have the money for the deposit of your profile, you can always crowdfund it from someone else. Um, and we actually have a, a, a part of the community uh, that tries to, to crowdfund for profiles that, that look legit and looks like they would need the money. Uh, and so once you generate your profile with the deposit and you get a vouch from someone else, there's a window of three and a half days where someone can challenge you. Uh, the system will have, is an optimistic system in the sense that uh, if no one challenges you, then the system will accept you and you will get verified as a valid, as a valid human. Uh, but if, that, if in that window of uh, three and a half days, someone ch challenges you, then the deposit will go into an arbitration court. Uh, and that's where Kleros comes in place, which is a system for arbitrating decisions on the blockchain. And the, the depositor, or, or sorry, the challenger uh, is incentivized uh, to detect fake profiles because if he then wins on the arbitration system, then he will get a, a part of the deposit himself. Um, the other part will go to the Kleros tutors that are trying to determine whether or not that profile was real or not. Kleros tutors are elected through a sortition process uh, among a, a network of stakers that have contributed to the, to the arbitration system. So uh, right now the incentives are economic, uh, and uh, and they uh, you know we have we have been able to see that there's always someone looking at the profiles. Uh, there are some tools that have been built by the community to ease the task of detecting duplicates. There's actually a website called humanity.tools that has a wide range of different demos and, and, and algorithms. One of those is a face matching algorithm that just simply looks at the face profile pictures of each uh, identity or proof of humanity and gives you a list of faces that look similar to, to the applicant so that you're trying to see if he has a duplicate or not. Uh, I'm sure that over time we'll see more tools like that. Like uh, another interesting approach would be a voice matching algorithm and, and see if the person you know, has a, an identical voice on the video. Um, but uh, right now for the challengers, the incentive is economic, trying to get the money from, from the deposit. Uh, of the 10,000 or so profiles, 500 got challenged. So that's that's around the, the, the rate of challenges that we have seen so far. Uh, and, uh, and sometimes it's a bit unfair, like challenges have been happening, for example, to people. At the beginning, we had a requirement that videos had to have 360 pixels at least of resolution in order to be valid uh, because we want to be able to see if there's a deep fake or if there's someone wearing makeup or something like that. Uh, and actually WhatsApp crops videos uh, to 352 pixels, removing four pixels from each side of the video, God knows why, or Zuckerberg knows why. Uh, but uh, 
uh, we had to upgrade the, the guidelines for the jurors when that was happening because there were a lot of malicious challengers simply challenging because the videos were 352 pixels wide instead of 360 pixels. So you see a lot of situations like that. Sometimes when you're using a decentralized system of arbitration, uh, you will find people trying to exploit it in ways that are not necessarily connected to an idea of justice, but uh, the, it plays under the logic of the game theory behind it. Cool. Uh, and, and I think one thing um, that's stuck out to me is essentially Kleros. Um, you know, like, it would, it, would be, it would be good to kind of understand, like, you know, how you guys integrate with Kleros and, you know, they say they're an arbitration as a service. You know, what exactly is that for, um, you know, Democracy Earth or Proof of Humanity? So, Kleros, uh, for any kind of, uh, let's say, uh, a registry or curated registry where you need, for example, to build a list of something. Uh, it's a very practical tool. Like Kleros has been used before to create a, a list of tokens. Uh, for example, Uniswap, you can use the curated list of tokens generated by uh, a Kleros arbitration system. Uh, and uh, the technology simply works. It's uh, You have uh, you have stakers that put uh, P and K, which is the native token to the system or to the court, and uh, the system will elect among the stakers uh, three or, or one or five uh, random jurors um, that will have the responsibility to vote over a decision uh, as, a, as, as if they were the oracles uh, that will inform the blockchain about the validity of that decision. Uh, usually, there's a couple of interesting aspects of the game theory behind it. Um, if you vote, uh, if you are the, if you are not the majority vote as a juror, you will lose your stake. So Jero, Kleros will incentivize for the vote to be unanimous, and if you are on the minority side of that vote, you risk losing your your stake because. Uh, you are not in agreement with the other jurors. All jurors have been elected that, uh, randomly. Also, if, if you forget to vote or don't vote, you lose your stake as well. So you, if you have stake on Kleros, you have the responsibility to check the, if you have been elected to vote on, on an issue. And then it's the rounds of appeals. Uh, if the losing side disagrees, uh, the losing side can always appeal but the cost of appealing will grow exponentially on each successive round. And there's a total of seven rounds. So if you keep losing, you can still defend yourself, but the cost will keep on incrementing for the losing side. Uh, so all of these mechanisms uh, are for the edge cases of proof of humanity, meaning those cases that are doubtful or were not uh, done properly or do not meet the guidelines that are or the requirements uh, to generate a profile. So proof of humanity uh, connects itself, the smart contract connects itself to the Kleros arbitration court in order to decide whether or not uh, a profile uh, belongs to, uh, is a, is, it, it meets the, the guidelines or, or is compliant with the guidelines or not. Right on. Uh, just sort of staying on economics incentives there for a moment. Um, one of the larger pieces of this is, of course, uh, you spoke about that a little bit around um, universal basic income and how that can provide a sort of uh, economic incentive. Do you see how that fits? Um, can you just talk about how that fits in with uh, crypto and like what we can do to sort of make those that idea work in this new system? Yeah, uh, well, that's one of the biggest challenges we have. You know, how, you know, once you have a registry of human identities, you can start thinking about blockchain applications that are uh, more social than, than just financial. Uh, that means we can start thinking about democracy or uh, universal basic income or uh, uh, uncollateralized credit or you know, many other applications we haven't seen. Uh, until the emergence of uh, decentralized identity protocols. And one of the most interesting ones is universal basic income. 
And we can talk a lot about the reasons of why UBI or uh, why UBI was supported by people like Milton Friedman or, or Hayek. Uh, and uh, even beyond the, the, the theory of it, uh, obviously, when you have a token that is constantly, constantly issuing new supply to every verified human, and with the UBI token, is one UBI per hour per human, uh, you have a, a challenge to think about mechanisms that can uh, uh, counterbalance that supply and generate demand. Uh, with UBI, we, we are doing multiple things around it. First of all, it's the first ERC20 token on Ethereum that streams itself. So an interesting thing is that once you become verified on Proof of Humanity uh, and you can uh, add the token, the UBI token on your on your MetaMask or whatever wallet you use, and you'll notice that uh, every second or every block really, because that's how Ethereum works, you will get uh, new fractions of UBI streamed into your wallet. And uh, in the new version of the token, we're actually uh, allowing you to restream and, and delegate your stream to multiple other accounts. So it will be interesting to see how real-time money works that way. Uh, but going back to the issue on, on inflation, uh, we have to find mechanisms that uh, burn the token or reduce the circulating supply of the token so it can guarantee a floor price for it to be able to, to trade and, or at least guarantee uh, a decent universal basic income to everyone in the system. Uh, one of the interesting projects that we worked on was with the Wiren community. Uh, they they have all these vaults that generate yield over any given asset. Uh, they have a vault on DAI and a vault on, on ETH. Uh, in US dollars, they generate uh, an average of 7 8% of APY, of uh, annual interest. So we, are, we actually created a, a, a couple of vaults that use the wire smart contracts where you can deposit DAI or you can deposit uh, ETH uh, and it generates yield and uh, the yield you will earn, uh, half of that yield will go into your pockets as an investor and the other half of the yield will automatically buy and burn UBI tokens, reducing the circulating supply of the token in, in the market. Um, so right now, for example, these vaults can be found on the democracy.earth website. Uh, we just put them in there so people can start quickly interacting with them. We have around half a million dollars uh, right now into the vault, in the vaults. We need something like two million dollars uh, in those. Uh, and that will allow us to, on each harvest, uh, to burn our, between $3,000 and $4,000 worth of tokens every 15 days or so. Uh, and that would uh, remove uh, 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 or keep the price of the token at a certain base uh, price. Um, we're still in the process of understanding the, these dynamics in the real world, other than in just a spreadsheet. Uh, but the, the fact that with Ethereum you have this kind of composability and, su and suddenly being able to think of an endowment model like this uh, without uh, you know, uh, too much complexity where you just allow for an investor to remain exposed to Ether or to DAI or to any asset they like and, and donate half of their yield in order to sustain universal basic income. Uh, to me, that's a very interesting possibility of what, how, how we can leverage uh, the Ethereum computer or the, or the blockchain in order to create a, a sustainable model for UBI over the long term. Um, these and other projects that have been built, been, are being built with the token uh, are really interesting to see. Uh, we are always looking to ways to improve the technology. And we are very conscious that we're on the very early days of this experiment, but so far, this year, we have probably paid out over a million dollars worth of UBI to a community of 10,000 humans. And it's, it hasn't been, even been a year yet. So I think that the potential is enormous. Uh, there's tremendous wealth being created of these networks. Uh, right now, there's over $60 billion of uh, locked value on, on smart contracts, on DeFi smart contracts. If we can use a fraction of that, uh, to sustain, to, to level the playing field for everyone around the world, that's mind-blowing. 
And that's the, the interesting thing about uh, building this on Ethereum is that uh, UEI is a level playing field technology in the sense that someone in Bangalore or in Buenos Aires or in uh, and in Africa will get the same amount of UBI than someone in Connecticut or London or a first world country. Uh, and actually, when you look at the registry of humans on, on proof of humanity, you will find effectively a lot of grandparents, uh, you will find families, you will find mothers, you will find students, uh, you'll find a lot of people from the developing world uh, probably will have a bias to Latin America because that's where some of us founders come from. And uh, I think that that meets, you know, the, the goal of UBI, which is, you know, leveling the playing field. And uh, if we can do that in a permissionless way, uh, in a global way, without relying with, on governments and through a uh, hundred percent volunteer acts uh, through investors or uh, donors around the world. I think that that would be a very interesting thing to see happening on the internet. Yeah, no, I I, t I totally agree. Um, you know, that's quite extraordinary. You know, a million dollars of UBI sent to like you know over ten thousand people. You know, and it's not even been a year, like you said. Yeah, that's um, that is really remarkable, and it does, um, you know, put put into question a lot of the traditional kind of economic models that you know people have kind of grew up with i'm an economist by trade as well so um you're kind of seeing you know this this like whole like new experiment or this whole new world is um you know it's it's it's, it's like so fascinating to me and i think one thing you kind of said earlier as well and um you know you kind of mentioned was that the the internet is basically not compatible with like nation states i, I think that very you know struck out to me quite a lot and it, it kind of shows the power of technology and i think you know, you know the way that you guys are kind of using this technology is um it's, it's, it's going to be a net positive and a net benefit to humanity in general i think um but yeah i, I i'm very interested in hearing some more thoughts on you know your, your kind of like concept of like um identity in the sense of nation states because if everyone and and there is a very common kind of like theme in the bitcoin community regarding economic um allegiance so like if everyone's holding bitcoin um and not us dollar they're more incentivized with like um maintaining do um, btc value for instance rather than the usd dollar um so you know their allegiance kind of shifts from a nation state to more of a like a global monetary system you know what your kind of thoughts you know in in creating these kind of new nation states on the internet so uh, there's something that edward snowden said once in 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 a conference I went to in Berlin a couple of years ago that I really liked, he said, obviously appearing on a huge screen, uh, identity is the one vulnerability being exploited across all systems. And uh, that is very important to make a different, differentiate when we build these systems between uh, verifying uh, who you are or you know where you come from, what's your name, what's your address, your personal information, and uh, verifying your right to use a, a technology. Uh, a system for voting doesn't need to know who you are. It only needs to know that you haven't voted twice. And in that regard, uh, as we are beginning to think uh, citizenship or identity in a post-nation state world after the age of Facebook and the Chinese Communist Party, which are both essentially the same thing, uh, simply achieved through different means, but at the end of the day, you know, our vectors that are of attack to our privacy and that are constantly trying to centralize information about each human being on their, on their region. Uh, it's very important to think about uh, how to build systems that can protect that privacy as much as possible and at the same time grant human rights. Uh, to me, one of the interesting challenges moving forward for proof of humanity is to make sure that we can build a technology that can be deployed, for example, in a refugee camp. Refugees are people that have been denied their identity by every single nation state in the world. Uh, right now, we have over 65 million refugees, uh, more than ever before in history, believe it or not. And uh, so the fact that we can build 
networks that are censorship resistant that can be accessed anywhere anywhere there's an internet connection and no government can can hijack them uh, is a very promising possibility we still have a long way to go there using ethereum today it's expensive uh rollups are just getting started on, on the mainnet uh, you know there's a lot of promising uh, paths uh, to moving forward but still the refugee can test we still need to 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 address that and be able to make sure that we are able to deploy this tech with the, at the lowest possible t uh, cost anywhere around the world. Um, I definitely believe we are in an age where we are shifting, uh, power is shifting from one generation to another. The difference between the two, the two generations uh, is the internet, those who have grown up with the internet and those that has discovered the internet in their adult life. Right now, most of the organizations around the world are governed or ruled, you know, the presidents or CEOs are fundamentally people that didn't grow up with the internet. Uh, but, you know, we're beginning to see some leaders like uh, the, the president of El Salvador, who is basically a millennial, uh, who is willing to use Bitcoin as a national currency. Uh, whether that's a, a victory of El Salvador against the IMF, or that's a victory of Bitcoin over El Salvador, uh, you know, remains to be seen. But uh, what I think it's clear that once we have this generational change moves on, uh, and political changes are generational changes, uh, we will see more more widespread adoption of these new technologies. And these new technologies are really not about giving any specific nation control over something. They're really about personal sovereignty. Uh, whoever has the keys has the power, uh, period. And that's a, a natural reality of how cryptography works. And I think that this new kind of sovereignty uh, will be tremendously beneficial, especially for the countries that have nothing to lose by uh, uh, you know, exiting the, or quitting the, the system of the IMF or the US dollar. I come from Argentina. Uh, we tried every single economic formula in our country, pegging our currency to the US dollar, uh, having inflation to subsidize costs of the working class, uh, you know, everything, all you can imagine, the Chicago school, the Austrian school, whatever. Uh, and uh, ultimately, you know, uh, in the last uh, decade or so, Argentina has seen a, an incredible generation of software engineers that were just after living crisis after crisis, willing to embrace this new technology in very radical ways. Uh, I'm, you know, Proof of Humanity has an Argentine founder. Uh, Kleros has an Argentine founder. Open Zeppelin, which is pretty much the blueprint of every single smart contract out there deployed on Ethereum, is an Argentine company. Uh, Decentraland, which has innovated on the concept of real estate. NFTs, the whole, you know, ERC-721, standard was developed by the founders of Decentraland, who are Argentine as well. So uh, I'm very optimistic about this new generation. And in that regard, I think that uh, with these networks, we have the possibility to dream a whole new set of institutions for the planet as a whole. And in that regard, with, uh, with everything that we're building, we're just discovering uh, you know, what's possible with distributed cryptography. Uh, and, and it's clear that it's not, not only going to be disrupting gold or disrupting money, as uh, Bitcoin proposed originally, but it's just uh, disrupting trust entirely and being able to generate or create all kinds of institutions, including institutions uh, of welfare like UBI and uh, of identity like uh, Proof of Humanity. Just touching on the the trust angle a little bit there, where um, in the Ethereum space and just in where everything's moving and changing so quickly right now, how do you for to bringing on board new people in in areas where they've sort of learned to distrust companies and internet, let's say like Facebook. Uh, Instagram, et cetera, 
they know that they're spying on them. They know that they're using their data for nefarious purposes. But how do you how do you get over that ick factor where someone's literally putting up their like kind of soul this is this is me, right? Like a lot of people have sort of turned to becoming more anon, not sharing things. How do you get over that kind of ick factor and get people to jump in head first to something that is sort of uh so so new to them so we you know it's it's being public or being private is more of a spectrum than a discrete thing uh and uh, what i like about uh, ethereum or you know web3 let's put it that way is that uh, the two greatest missing components of the traditional or legacy web has been definitely identity and privacy. Uh, there's no formal layer of identity, which led to that being captured by Facebook and Google. And there's uh, no way of uh, formally connecting to systems in an encrypted way, which has led to you know stuff like uh, HTTPS and uh, things that still you know the client server architecture still naturally leads to kind of an Orwellian situation where you will have multiple clients connecting to the same server, giving that server tremendous amount of power. So with Web3, we finally have, uh, through the use of our wallets, uh, the possibility to decide how we expose ourselves to the internet. Uh, everyone knows, or at least everyone that interacts with me on Twitter knows that the address on Ethereum Santi.eth uh, is me. Like I, that's on my Twitter handle, that's on my different profiles, and it's just a way of reaching me out on Ethereum. It's on my proof of humanity profile, it's the address that I use for that. And it's a way of reaching me out in a very public way. But I, I am able to uh, instantaneously become anonymous on, a, on any Web3 system by switching into a different account on my wallet. And uh, I think that ultimately with privacy, it really boils down to educating the end user. You cannot uh, control your privacy if someone else always needs to do it for you. Uh, so it requires, uh, it's like a, it's hygiene. You know, you have to have hygiene with your private parts on the internet as well. Uh, and uh, that requires to teach people that, you know, when you use an address on, on MetaMask or whatever wallet you use, uh, if you are showing in public that that address is associated with your name, that address is no longer pub, uh, no longer private. If you use an address that never has been in connection to your name in public, then you can assume that there's a pretty decent level of privacy with that. And uh, I like that idea you know, of having multiple masks uh, and being able to show yourself on the internet or reveal yourself on the internet in a way that you have a control over that. Uh, with proof of humanity, we have to make a trade-off. We need a system where you can effectively verify duplicates. Uh, I believe that faces have evolved through nature as a system of recognizing each other at a distance. Uh, you know, our faces are in a way a fingerprint, uh, but it's not exactly biometric, like it's not exactly precise. It works very well. We can look at each other and know who we are talking to. Uh, you can always use your, use, make your proof of humanity profile without your real legal name or your anything that identifies you in a real uh, legacy way, let's say that. But you, you can simply use your face. Uh, you, you need to show your face so someone else can verify that if, if you have a duplicate or not in the system. And that was the best trade-off we could find now. Uh, Maybe there's better ways of doing this, this tuning resistant approach in the future. And we're always definitely researching that. Uh, there's a paper actually I co-authored called Who Watches the Watchmen that analyzes seven different systems of decentralized identity. Some of them use tuning tests that have to be solved synchronously. Uh, others use a, a web of trust where people have to vouch for each other. There are different models, uh, but ultimately you need some kind of registry that you can effectively trust that uh, you have absolute certainty that an address belongs to a unique human and, and doesn't have multiple keys in the registry. That, that 
that's incredibly valuable if you want to start thinking about social technologies. And as users, we just you know need to be aware that okay, uh, maybe this address you know you know will be for public life, and then other addresses can remain completely private, and you can have you can easily manage that thanks to the standards and, and what has been laid out by the Ethereum project and, and the whole Web3 movement. Yeah, I, th I think that's uh, very interesting, and it does kind of change um, the nature of like just human interaction, I guess. Um, so, w one kind of question I have is essentially on, you know, as people, you know, age, you know, will you also be updating their kind of identity on the protocol? Yes, the, the, I think that the the profiles last for one year, and. Uh, you, you need to keep on updating your profile throughout time if you want to keep receiving the, the UBI token or, or participate in the Proof of Humanity ecosystem. Cool. Um, so, I mean, I think I had a question regarding, um, you know, death and inheritance planning because, you know, because your, your system, and I, I think I read this on some talk, technical um, documents somewhere on one of your pages, and, you know, you do mention inheritance planning. So, I mean, what are your kind of thoughts on that? You know, are you trying to integrate with, um, I mean, eventually what I suppose you could become is um, something uh, what Balaji calls a network state. So if we are to use your kind of protocol and, you know, the entire, let's say the entire world uses your protocol, you know, it would, it, it would, it would definitely change, um, you know, inheritance planning as well, because, you know, there is this sort of, um, you know, new kind of, layer they have to take off i suppose i we, i haven't explored too deeply the situation of inheritance or you know yeah. death. Uh, but um, yeah a proof of death <laughs> or a system like that will eventually emerge i don't know how that would work out what what we know what we have implemented is simply a system that will give you a, a valid profile for one year and uh, you have to renew it uh, there's debate around the community whether or not to extend the period of time that can be it's a setting that can be governed by the DAO and the DAO might, might decide to change that uh, but certainly we will see in the future uh, applications that can uh, connect or, or plug uh, or ask you know because ultimately when you think of a, a certificate uh, or any kind of uh, non-fungible token that can be associated to an identity, if it's associated to a same address belonging to a proof of humanity address, then you can simply look at that proof of humanity address and uh, and look at any NFT associated to it and you can assume that that person uh, has a certificate of any given nature, whether it's a certificate of death or something else. Uh, someone could easily co make a, a system that composes with proof of humanity and, and issue something like that. Cool. Yeah. Um, and one thing that I've been kind of wondering in terms of like governance systems is essentially, um, you know, fracturing of communities. So as a community usually gets larger and larger, it becomes harder and harder to like have that kind of initial, um, you know, core ideology, let's say. So like, I mean, ha have you have you witnessed that with your kind of project in the sense of, you know, um you know like the community is it i'm not saying is it a, it's a threat of splitting but you know there have been like instances with the sushi swap and uniswap people where you know they kind of forked the entire community um do, do you do you see that happening or um you know if so like you know would you want to mitigate that would you want to support that or you know so there's more than one kind of ubi protocol you know what, what are your exact thoughts on that so yeah, we, we had our, our internal struggles as a, as a community and growing pains. Uh, we went very quickly from zero to, to you know, a few thousand users. And um, we, have, uh, we, we took a very bold decision to make our DAO uh, to be a democracy where it's one person, one vote. And uh, we obviously mitigated that with a little bit of liquid democracy, where you can delegate your vote yeah. to someone you know and trust. And uh, if you look at the distribution of votes in the DAO, there's probably two chiefs right now. 
uh, myself and Clement Lesage, who is one of the founders of Kleros. Uh, and clearly that's the reason for that is, I would argue in political terms is that you have in, within the community, uh, people that come from the Kleros camp that uh, you know, are interested in pursuing a new uh, use case for, for the Kleros protocol. And we have people that come from na natively from Proof of Humanity Actually, many of them probably being also uh, new users of Ethereum entirely uh, that mm, are willing to criticize or to argue about the aspects of the inner workings of, of Kleros. So we had a couple of very strong debates uh, and strong decisions uh, that led to the community discovering simply what, what were, where the interests are uh, and all communities and all internal divides or ripples or you know clashes of this kind are ultimately you know they, they are because of economic interests of one kind or another uh, we <laughs> what was it was uh, i think that the, that one of the things that triggered a, a major crisis was uh, one of the moderators in the telegram group uh, that i assigned uh, who was actually defending a lot of users from losing their funds because of malicious challengers. And this is the guy that actually uh, pushed for improving the, the protocol guidelines to allow 352 pixels videos. Mm -hmm. uh, this guy was very combatant uh, against Kleros. And obviously this didn't, wasn't welcomed by the Kleros camp uh, side of the community. And we had a strong argument about whether this guy should or shouldn't be a, a, a Telegram moderator. My position was that uh, he was incredibly helpful to a lot of new users, helping them uh, to avoid losing their money due to a malicious challenge. Uh, and at the same time, the Kleros community argued that he brought a, a toxic environment to, to the community because he was criticizing Kleros in a very harsh way. So uh, that led to a couple of votes in relation to content moderation of the Telegram groups that were very heated, uh, heavily debated. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but, you know, uh, obviously, I think we were also in a process of discovering the limits of the governance process that we have put in place into, into these things. Uh, but you know, thankfully, we, we all met in, in the real world in Paris on ECC. And, uh, you know, we, we all grabbed a beer. We laughed about it. We, we were like, well, what the hell is going on with, with what we have been building? It's very precious. You know, we have to be more responsible. Uh, and, and I think that we all agree that, you know, no one wants to, to have an inf a lot of infighting within the community. Uh, and I, you know, uh, I, I just consider myself lucky to be working among many brilliant developers uh, and that come from different you know, places around the world that are contributing to the Proof of Humanity project. So we, I think we shared an attitude, we all share an attitude of really taking care of our community uh, as much as we can. We will have disagreements. Disagreements are okay. We can find you know, different mechanisms to sort out those disagreements. Uh, but we don't want to see a split or a fork or, you know, there's, there's absolutely no need for that. It's only 10,000 users. Uh, you know, we are still discovering what it means to, to do formalized human identity on, on a blockchain. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, I think that we, 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 we are at least from coming from the core team and from the founding team of the project, uh, we're making a very conscious effort to, to really have a lot of dialogue between us, uh, have been very open with the community. We are actually the third most used, uh, 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 the third most used page on Snapshot. Like we had so many votes. You can check the proof of humanity and the UBI. We have two DAOs actually now, the UBI DAO and the proof of humanity DAO. They, are, they both vote on Snapshot. And someone told me the other day that we rank on the third position. And, and I was telling this to Clement from, from Kleros. And Clement told me, well, probably that's because we disagree all the time, you and me. <laughs> uh, uh, but, you know, in crypto, I learned over the years that conflict is a feature, not a bug. Uh, conflict means people care. Uh, worry if no one is talking. Uh, 
but uh, I definitely don't see any kind of fork happening uh, from the project itself. Uh, we we um, we are all like uh, you know we need to focus on the relevant stuff like scaling, uh, building on a rollup, uh, lowering the cost of the deposit, making a user interface that works on cheap smartphones. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a lot of other more important problems to figure out other than, uh, you know, making uh, animal farm like uh, revolts in the community. We touched on it a little bit there, uh, the cost of actually getting on to the proof of humanity sitting at around uh, 0.12 ETH. Um, $500 is not a small amount of money for a lot of people in the world. Um, a lot of people who would get the most out of this, both in terms of potentially the UBI and um, being involved in the building of the project, that might be out of reach of them right now. How do we get yeah. the sort of, um, you know, the million uh, third world engineers to pile into a project like this? That's an excellent question. Uh, so right now, you know, the reason the deposit has to be paid on ETH is because we need to afford the gas that executes the different functions that calls to the arbitration court if it needs to be called. Uh, and, uh, you know, we operate on the context of Ethereum. And uh, I agree that $500 is a lot of money for most of the people around the world. Uh, the first mechanism that we identify to mitigate that is crowdfunding. So, there's actually a part of the community created a Telegram channel called the Rolling Funds, and they simply crowdfund the ETH uh, for those profiles that look for people that would really need the UBI. And uh, it has been working, but obviously it's not a very scalable approach. Uh, we have been able to cut the cost from 0 0.18 to 0 0.12 by reducing the requirement of jurors that would decide over the cases of proof of humanity. It used to be three jurors. Now it's going to be only one, uh, and there's there has been a whole uh, improvement proposal specific uh, about this that at least helped to reduce the cost uh, forty percent. Uh, we we see some ways of reducing it even way more to even to down to sixty dollars or fifty dollars, uh, but uh, we still need to understand how to make those optimizations. Uh, we are working in collaboration with the Kledos team uh, in order to understand how to make a much more efficient way of uh, tampering into their protocol. Uh, and Kledos is obviously right now working on the version 2 of their protocol, so uh, we are very aware of, the, of, the, of, this, of this cost. Um, and a, a, a good, we have already migrated or we have already implemented a version of Kledos Proof of Humanity and UBI on XDAI as a sidechain. So we have a cheaper environment where you can play with this technology. Uh, but obviously, working with a rollup will be extremely important in the future. Uh, that would help us also significantly reduce the cost of executing the functions required for the smart contract. Uh, so we, we are suffering from the same pains Ethereum as a whole is suffering because of how expensive it is to use right now the mainnet. Uh, but I'm, I'm optimistic that with uh, optimizations around the Clero smart contract, optimizations around the, you know, my, you know being able to implement this on rollups uh, and ultimately the scalability of Ethereum itself, transitioning to proof of stake uh, will help get us to a point where ideally we have a deposit that is uh, below $100 uh, if we can go all the way down to $10 or $5, that would be uh, more than ideal. That's one of the biggest challenges that we face in our roadmap, reducing the costs uh, so we can onboard more people. Uh, and uh, obviously, the, those that are you know uh, uh, getting into the registry right now are, pioneer, help us, are helping us pioneer this whole concept. Uh, but, but it's definitely one of the top priorities right now to to find more and more mechanisms that can help us optimize the cost of using proof of humanity. Yeah, so um, t touching on that, you know, you, you say um, on your documentation that you're currently based on layer one. W what are your thoughts on, you know, transferring to a layer two 
um, and you know, because you, you say you want more interoperability, um, you know, as a layer one, um, you know, like what, what's your kind of decision making process behind that? Um, you know, why did you, you know, decide that? And you know, is there a possible future where you could possibly go to a layer two? Well, Ethereum is uh, building uh, on, on Ethereum means building. I think that the, the, the two most important salient th things about it is first the composability. It means that you will be able to uh, plug your protocol or your smart contract to other protocols and other smart contracts uh, in the ecosystem. Uh, Proof of Humanity and UBI are using uh, Uniswap, uh, are using uh, uh, Yearn, uh, we are using uh, Kleros. Like all of that composability that helps harness the power of the Ethereum world computer is an incredible feature that you really uh, grasp once you are out there uh, suddenly seeing that you can, you know, tap into these uh, contracts in a permissionless way and suddenly, you know, empowering your project with capabilities you you didn't think of uh, at, at the beginning. So it's an incredibly composability, it's an incredibly powerful thing of building on Ethereum. And the other aspect is liquidity. Uh, you are tapping into resources that in some cases manage billions of dollars. And um, the access to that kind of liquidity, you know, for example, we were able to list, uh, to, to start getting the UBI token to be immediately traded from day zero without uh, needing to go to any single centralized exchange. And we all know that centralized exchanges are incredibly shady. Uh, so that allowed us to start immediately giving liquidity to the token and immediately allowing people to benefit from the UBI token uh, in, in incredible new ways. Uh, and that's because of you know how we can compose and how we can use resources that have enormous amount of liquidity. So building on, on mainnet, building on layer one, uh, it makes plenty of sense because it's, it's, it's an environment where you really want to be because of how incredibly powerful this, 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 this network uh, actually is. Now, um, obviously, layer two is a priority right now. We are still on research mode. Uh, Arbitrum has launched on mainnet just a, a week ago. Uh, Optimism. Uh, they are doing. They have. Uh, they, they actually have an, an interesting agenda of retro, retro funding public goods. So they want to support public goods, and uh, you know, I'm trying to reach out to their team to talk about proof of humanity as a public good, uh, and uh, whether it's optimism, arbitrum, or something else. Um, we definitely need to advance in the direction of a layer two strategy because. Uh, it significantly reduces the cost of everything. And uh, that means that we will be able to include and to onboard way more people than we have onboarded right now. All of the decentralized identity projects somehow stagnate at the number of 9,000, 10,000 users. And we are at that point right now ourselves. And uh, I think it, it boils down to you know how costly it is to, to really use these networks today. You have to be really willing to and join a, an, an experiment, you know, which, which is still, uh, it's, a, it's been a few months, uh, but, uh, but uh, uh, layer two is definitely a priority. Uh, there are different aspects to, to take into consideration. Uh, also working with technology that allows to bring more privacy into the system, being able to use zero knowledge proofs, so you can use proof of humanity and, and vote anonymously and uh, allow to make uh, the voting, whether it's an or DAO or other DAOs in a private way, I think that would be highly beneficial to the ecosystem as well. Uh, so we are, you know, paying close attention to all of these projects. I have been talking to developers of other protocols that have implemented, uh, whether on Arbitrum or on Optimism or some other rollup, uh, and, and taking as many notes as possible and will probably uh, announce a strategy of our own very soon uh, but yeah it's 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 obviously a very high priority and and I think everyone that's serious about this space is, is now thinking about the layer two strategy.
just uh, staying on um, sort of side topic there, but the the sort of rapid change and taking advantage of both, like you said, uh, Arbitrum just launched last week. Um, as as sort of the tech gets better every day, the sort of people who would attack this project and try and take advantage of it also get better at doing so. Um, in terms of generating deep fakes, uh, fake humans and sort of is is there anything you have sort of in mind in terms of taking care of that before before it becomes an issue yeah the deep fake apocalypse scenario uh, we actually we, we are looking to hire uh, and when i say we i'm talking about the dao the dao is looking to hire a couple of uh, employees and some you know a project manager and a developer and on the interviews that we held, uh, we all, always ask them about what what would be their 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 uh, recommendation on a deep fake apocalypse scenario. Right now, deep fakes are uh, expensive to make and usually work very well if you are Tom Cruise or some kind of celebrity that has enough data out there about uh, your face as possible. Uh, so generating a reliable deep fake over any random human is actually pretty hard. Uh, and you will notice that the face doesn't look right into, into the person that you're putting your face into, onto. Uh, but uh, it's definitely one vector of attack that we need to contemplate because as computing costs, uh, you know, the, 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 uh, Moore's law keeps on applying it to the computing industry and uh, making these videos gets more and more cheap and better. And, you know, right now you have a incredibly photorealistic um, photographs of uh, random people like this website, this person does not exist.com or uh, the face app that turns anyone into an old person or into a woman, if you're a man or vice versa. And all of those work very well at the photograph level. Uh, they still don't work very well at the video level. So mm -hmm. I think we have a window of opportunity for the time being that we can rely on the on the videos. Uh, what we're going to be announcing very soon uh, with Molok DAO. Molok DAO is, is a DAO that uh, is uh, has uh, invested in a lot of very interesting research projects on Ethereum. And uh, we're going to be announcing a bounty and uh, that uh, will be between 50k and 100k uh, for anyone to break proof of humanity, uh, whether it's through a deep fake attack, whether it is through a civil attack over a period of time, uh, or uh, detecting some kind of collusion among uh, shooters, for example. Uh, the, the bounty is being written right now, so we'll hopefully in a couple of weeks we'll put it out there. And if someone can and achieve this, uh, there will be a hefty price for for whoever is willing to able to to do this. Um, going back to the you know the whole notion of identity. So right now, there's a lot of other identity protocols. Um, you mentioned Three Box. Uh, I think I've talked to them briefly, um, and we, we, I think we're going to try to have them on the podcast as well. But um, yeah, like one kind of question I'm wondering is like. With all these kind of identity protocols, is there going to be a sort of coalition or is there going to be, you know, a, like, how do you challenge the, um, you know, the uh, fracturing of like identity protocols, let's say? I think that, you know, I actually been talking to the Gitcoin team about this. Uh, Gitcoin is pursuing, uh, Gitcoin has been probably the first project out there to uh, implement the multiple uh, decentralized identity projects into their own into their own system. So on Gitcoin, you can use IDNA or Bright ID or Proof of Humanity to uh, authenticate yourself. And the more you know uh, pointers to identity you provide or civil resistant uh, mechanisms you provide to identify yourself, uh, Gitcoin will give you more points when you when you contribute to to the different projects. Um, they are looking, you know, this whole proof of personhood movement. Uh, Gitcoin is uh, interested in doing some sort of aggregator where you can uh, you can verify your identity on any given system, and through the use of an aggregator, 
to weight the value of that identity. Uh, so you can you can just use that to authenticate yourself. Uh, I think we'll see something like that emerge. Uh, maybe some people like to use something more privacy preserving like right ID or IDNA. Uh, maybe some people like to use proof of humanity because of the UBI token. Uh, or maybe there's some other project that will emerge into the future. I think it's likely that we'll see multiple ways of making this attestation of uh, humanity. Uh, yeah, and, uh, you know, we need to think in, in a way that expands uh, the, the use cases and the, and the relevance of Ethereum as an economic project. So I'm all in for, you know, collaborating and cooperating with these projects. O over the month of August, actually, we held a series of workshops. Uh, uh, Paula Berman from, from Democracy Earth, actually, uh, and some other researchers uh, you know, brought in together every single person that's thinking around proof of personhood. Uh, we had Vitalik also uh, sharing some thoughts. And uh, it's, it's definitely an area of research that is very... Uh, it's picking up right now. There's a lot of people interested in it. And the good thing about today is that we have several protocols out there. Like there's Bright ID, there's IDINA, which is this project that uses Turing tests uh, to, to sort out who's a human or not. And we have Proof of Humanity. Uh, just two years ago or three years ago, nothing existed. None of this existed. So I think it's we're all going in a very positive direction moving forward. And, you know, we're... We need to think in terms of abundance, not in terms of scarcity. Like uh, uh, we, in a context of abundance, it makes more sense to cooperate than to compete. And uh, the more, the, you know, the more ways we can find to make sure we can uh, have attestations of human beings on the blockchain, uh, and the more reliable these ways are, uh, these these things are, and then the more likely that we'll end up seeing. Uh, democracy in cyberspace or a universal basic income at a global scale. Uh, when we think about these networks, we need to think uh, not about uh, disrupting Wall Street. That's, that's already a done deal. We already won. Like the, the Occupy generation of 2008 already took over Wall Street. There's no single person with a brain on Wall Street that is not buying crypto or uh, buying NFTs or buying Bitcoin. Wall Street is already, uh, you know, has already been beaten. Uh, I think that we need to address really way more larger problems. Uh, and I come from a country that has 50% of its people living under the line of poverty. So if we can start building with these networks systems that can guarantee a basic means of life for everyone on, on the developing world or, or any, everyone in the planet, because poverty is not a, a strict problem of the developing world. It's just more, more uh, massive there. Uh, but uh, uh, I think that if we can really put those kinds of ambitious goals in the roadmap of uh, Ethereum or you know, blockchain-based networks, uh, then that's thinking really big. Uh, it's not just you know making huge amounts of money. You know, that, that already happened in the first decade. And it's clear that these systems can create value, that can generate wealth, uh, and can you know make a lot of very interesting people. Uh, or very intelligent people, incredibly wealthy. That, that's fine. Uh, but we, what you know, I think that we need to think over the next couple of decades is uh, how we make these systems benefit everyone. Uh, how we make these systems, uh, you know, beat the drug lord that is trying to seduce a teenager in a slum uh, in Colombia. Uh, how we can make uh, an alternative that helps these networks uh, make sure that anyone can access uh, a decent education or uh, won't have to fear for, for whether they will have dinner or not uh, that night. That's a, a very real reality of our world today. An ignore reality for the most part when you look at the media or what is being debated. Uh, but it's pretty safe to say that more than half of the people around the world are, are living in very precarious conditions while tremendous amount of wealth is being generated. So uh, that's what I like about Proof of Humanity is that uh, our agenda, you know, is to end poverty. 
that's our, our, our goal. You know, if you can, if we can make a UVI as a technology that can reach anyone on the planet without relying on governments because they are incredibly corrupt uh, and just uh, simply being able to be present on every phone uh, and being able to give people a basic means of life, that's an incredible goal. Uh, with, with the web too, we had social media, right? Uh, but when you think about blockchains in a social way, it's not media. It's way more than just media uh, because these are economic networks. They are not the networks of information. They are networks of value. So when we think about, you know, Vitalik gave this, this keynote on ECC about uh, post-DeFi uh, Ethereum. And he focused on the social media use case. But my, my recommendation to Vitalik would be like, uh, it's not just about, you know, obviously finding credibly neutral mechanisms to uh, censor information. I think that's incredibly relevant, no? But uh, uh, because of the economic nature of these networks, like addressing social problems, like people living uh, with $1 a day or not being able to afford having dinner that night, like in, in proof of humanity, I've seen grandparents uh, that are getting a better pension from out of the UBI token than from the government. Uh, and uh, if we can really scale something like this, then it's, uh, it's a very profound change in civilization. And uh, I think that, you know, crypto and, and, and blockchains are definitely the economic narrative of the 21st century. Uh, is it going to be a narrative uh, that only creates a new kind of oligarchy among programmers instead of you know bankers or is it going to be about uh, something that can really shape the lives of future generations in a much more uh, sustainable way and, and, and without uh, as much uh, exclusion and marginalization as it is, there is today and uh, you know i think that a lot you know a reason why we see a lot of people coming from the developing world becoming uh, solidity engineers, smart contract developers, at least this is what I've seen from, from Argentina, where I come from, is because we, we see a lot of hope in these technologies and, and, and certainly hope to, to see some uh, radical changes uh, emerge out of, of, of these networks mm -hmm. that will positively impact our societies. Yeah, and sort of just rolling into that, you, you mentioned earlier about uh, the education DAO. Um, is there anything you can speak about that regarding sort of bringing people into the ecosystem so that, you know, more people can take advantage of this? Yes, education DAO is a project I started in Spain, uh, where I live now, but aimed at everyone in Spain and everyone in Latin America, where we all speak the same language, Spanish. And the idea is to generate educational content about crypto for new users, you know, the people that are curious about the subject but haven't ever used well, uh, either Bitcoin or Ethereum uh, to learn about it and to generate content in Spanish that can be easily digestible by, by anyone coming from, from these communities. And uh, obviously, you know, with Proof of Humanity, we discovered that a lot of the people that got onboarded there were for the first time in their lives using something like MetaMask or, uh, uh, you know, uh, interacting with Ethereum. So with Education DAO, we're trying to, to hopefully provide a context where people can learn about this with real life, uh, with live lessons uh, and with videos, recorded videos. Uh, and then try to generate a, or try to generate an environment where we can think about the future of education. Uh, it all boils down to education at the end of the day. Uh, mm -hmm. How to make people more capable of how to use the internet in a much more intelligent way. How to protect their privacy. How to uh, benefit from these networks in multiple ways. Boils down to education, and, and, and that's why we built this, this project, Education Now. I'm I'm excited to see what sort of comes of that because in in my mind you you mentioned this a little bit around um, you know government and states and things people are sort of slowly realizing that they don't really need a lot of what they're paying for or they're sort of getting from their 
their nation state or what have you. And I think the education piece is the biggest part of that is people need to realize that um, the systems they grew up with or whatever aren't necessarily the best systems going forward. Yeah, I, I think all, all institutions are being disrupted uh, after we discover that we can replace authority with cryptography. Uh, institutions at the end of the day are a collection of promises uh, and what uh, backs the promises of legacy institutions is basically force you know you will obey the authority or else you know uh, well uh, and you know those promises break up very easily like uh, the you know in Argentina we grew up believing our money in the bank was going to be there the next day until one day the money in the bank wasn't there and mm. the, you know the promises got broken very very easily very fast uh, with cryptography uh, in the promises are backed by mathematics and by entropy and in this universe which is very hard to break at, uh, at uh, you know at the scale of these networks and uh, those are harder promises to break you know so it's soft promises versus hard promises and i think that the the more we understand the nature of these networks, uh, the more likely they will disrupt every single institution in place, including identity, including uh, a, including education, for sure. Uh, and it's exciting to to be working among you know many talented developers and, and researchers uh, in this ecosystem that are really shaping up the future uh, with 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 our discoveries or with their with our ideas and mm. with implementations. Uh, it's a very real and tangible thing today, but it's still very small. So it's an exciting time to, to be building with, with Ethereum. Who are, your, um, who are your biggest allies in the sort of traditional institutional world? <laughs> Do you have any, I <laughs> really? <laughs> like... I don't have anyone left. Uh, I like the traditional institutional world. I, you know, I have to be thankful to a couple of organizations that very early on supported my work. Uh, y Combinator is one of them. We, you know, we were able to start a foundation in California. We're a nonprofit, uh, thanks to a, an original check given to us by Y Combinator, uh, which is an accelerator in, in Silicon Valley, very well known to have, they, they back very important startups. Not our case, you know, we're a non-profit, so we're one of the weird animals of YC. Uh, we also were lucky to get support from the Templeton World Charity uh, Organization. Templeton uh, funds a lot of uh, scientific research that might not get the backing from uh, traditional universities, uh, but are, is, is the kind of research that might be interesting enough to, to support from outside the, the traditional academic route. Uh, but, uh, you know, other than some of the donors and, 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 and organizations that back us, uh, we are really about, you know, we're a bunch of crypto anarchists trying to think institutions under a completely, under a complete new lens. Uh, and that's why we embrace the idea of uh, building proof of humanity as a DAO. Uh, we embrace the idea of uh, making sure we can you do uh, if we're gonna make it be making decisions do it in a way where we use these technologies we use our own dog food uh we you know proof of humanity enabled us to become a democratic DAO uh with the ubi token uh, we're actually implementing a, a version of quality voting which is really interesting uh and you know it's we need to bootstrap ourselves and create a new institution and new institutionality through the means of of these networks and uh, in that regard i think that everyone involved with this project uh, we are all pretty much on a very aligned that uh, we need to pursue this path in the most authentic possible way um i i just have i think one last um key question and it's regarding um you know you essentially mentioned that you will get to a point where you don't have like your the video won't be public um, but like my kind of question is like you know how how would you make the um, the verification private um, but still um, you know auditable in a sense? That's a great question, and if you have any good answers to that, I'm all ears. Uh, <laughs> you 
it's not like it's a it's an easy thing to to, yeah. to do. Um, I, I you know when you look at the nature of these systems, you you can really divide them into you have objective systems and subjective systems. Objective systems are the kinds of systems that use some some form of biometric, whether it's scanning your iris or uh, finding some kind of voice speech uh, pattern recognition system or uh, your fingerprint or something like that that can be objectively measured uh, but once you have an objective system in place uh, wh whatever algorithm designed to recognize that pattern uh, can be used to ge generate uh, fake uh, quantities of that pattern in an infinite way uh, like you can generate fake fingerprints or fake iris uh, patterns or fake uh, voice patterns uh, in multiple ways and the objective system will simply not be able to understand if it, it is effectively interacting uh, with a real uh, metric or, or with a fake metric of, of an entity. Uh, whereas with subjective systems, uh, you know, it's just opening up the whole process of verification in a way that you can check how each person has been verified by simply auditing the verification yourself uh, or, or the verification of someone else or anyone else yourself in a permissionless way. And with videos, it's, you know, it's just uh, looking at each other into our faces and simply trying to acknowledge or recognize if that person uh, is, is, has a, is, is very similar looking to someone else or uh, use some kind of subjective input uh, in order to rank or to, to verify the profile. Um, we, we, you know, if we're, talk, we're, if we're serious about decentralized identity, building a system that is subjective and building a system that you can audit how other profiles have been verified at any given point in time into the future, really matters because what boils down the nature of these systems is answering this question which is who watches the watchman uh, if there is a single authority verifying all of the profiles because it controls some kind of biometric algorithm then you have big brother all over again and we want to escape big brother here we want to escape mark zuckerberg or xi jinping we need to build a system where we all we are all a bunch of little brothers rather than one huge big brother. And the, that's why the, the, the main rationale of how we think about decentralized identity is not so much about, obviously it's important, but you know, your keys, your identity, obviously that's an important aspect of it. But the fundamental aspect of it is that uh, there is no single central watchman deciding over the fate of the identities being generated in the system that uh, anyone can check over anyone and anyone can challenge anyone uh, at, at any given point in time. Uh, so today, we, we, the trade-off that we made is using uh, a video proof. Uh, if there's, you know, we, we had all kinds of crazy ideas suggested to us. Uh, some of them maybe might be implementable, but, uh, you know, at the end of the day, you need to build a system that also any average human can use and understand. So there's a lot of trade-offs in the decisions we made. Uh, I think that we reached a nice sweet spot with what we launched with Proof of Humanity, but there's always room for improvement. And with new techniques, uh, maybe in the future, we, we are able to find more privacy-preserving ways. I believe that still privacy is a bit of a spectrum, not a really discrete thing. And that the, the best thing that we can do in the future is to uh, build on top of the proof of humanity protocol, a zero knowledge proof layer that allows you to interact with other systems in a private manner, but you have the guarantee that you, you, know, you have a civil resistant place, civil resistant system uh, at the base layer in place. So, uh, you know, that, that, that probably will have to require some kind of disclosing of information about yourself. I, I believe faces are pretty much a public asset anywhere we go around the world right now. So uh, it's just adapting to, to, to the reality we live in. Uh, and probably a zero knowledge proof layer on top of that would, would do most of the tricks very well.
Cool. Um, yeah, I, I think that, you know, um, definitely sums up pretty much all the kind of questions we had. Was there anything that specifically the, the you wanted to mention or any questions that you had? No, you know, really great conversation. I appreciate uh, the, the time and the uh, insightful uh, dissection of proof of humanity that we need today. Uh, just uh, for anyone here, if they want to learn more about the project, uh, you can find me on Twitter, I'm at Santi City on Twitter. Uh, City like the iPhone app, uh, no relation. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, proof of humanity, at proof of humanity, proof of humanity.id if you want to, to test the protocol and, and, and become a verified human on Ethereum. Cool. Um, yeah, well, I de definitely appreciate, um, you know, your work and your time here as well. So, um, you know, best of luck. And I, I definitely may have some ideas because I'm definitely working on some stuff that, you know, um, could definitely integrate with that. So, yeah, uh, look forward to uh, speaking to you soon. Yeah, thank you so much for your time and uh, for your, your very candid answers to some of these questions. Thank you, guys.